how Holly began her career in teacher librarianship may resonate with some of you. Because Holly uh, kind of moved from being a classroom teacher, winging it, as she says, in the school library, into being a qualified uh, teacher librarian. And I know for myself, uh, I actually started off as what they call a teacher in charge um, of the school library, and then I undertook the course, because it was an interesting era. <coughs> we actually got paid by the government to do the course. Um, so that's interesting, because then you have to go on the waiting list. But yes, that's the, the past, we're moving on. And also, uh, Holly is a passionate campaigner for the vital role that uh, teacher librarians play within the school libraries. And as was already mentioned uh, for, by Holly, that uh, it was a delight also for me to be present at the Australian School Library Association conference when Holly was recognised and acknowledged for her contribution to the profession, but also for the work that she is, is doing within the campaign at that conference. So uh, it was great to be there to witness that. So Holly's here today to inspire us and uh, get us revved up for the Students Need School Libraries campaign. Welcome, Holly. Thank you. Uh, so just a quick check in with all of you here. Uh, could you please raise your hand if you've heard of the Students Need School Libraries campaign? Great. Um, and if you, again, if you have connected with it on social media or the newsletter, fantastic. Um, who, I'm curious, would say that they are actively supporting the campaign? Who would put themselves in that category? Okay, fantastic. Um, different angle of this next question. Who knows someone personally in your personal life, a young person who you care about, who is at a school with a school library that isn't what it can and should be. Okay, thank you. Um, just very briefly, a little bit about me. I didn't do this the last time I presented and someone came up to me and said like, who are you, where are you from? <laughs> where do you work now? So just very briefly, um, I grew up in Connecticut. Uh, I lived in Canberra since 2000. Um, I started teaching in 1999 and have had 15 years in primary schools and four years in senior secondary. Um, I started working in a school library in 2005 and became a proper teacher librarian in 2015 when I finally had finished my teacher librarian qualification. Um, and I work now at a public school, which is a senior secondary college in Canberra. So I'm standing here today, first and foremost, as an organizer, and a, a community organizer, and we're part of the community. So I'm not, what I mean by that is, I'm not going to talk about how to do your job well. Um, what I'm here to talk about is how to campaign well. So I'd like you to keep this question in mind for the whole time that I'm speaking. How does this Students Need School Library campaign apply to your context? And I mean your personal context, um, your professional context, and how you fit in also in as a member, a caring member of your local community, of your global community. Um, I'm also going to be very upfront about my goal for this session. Um, which is that I am hoping to equip you with enough knowledge and inspiration that you will walk out of here today and actively support the Students Need School Library campaign. And if you already consider yourself to be doing that, that you are going to be ready and willing to kick it up a level. Um, and why, why am I asking that? Why am I hoping that that will happen? Because the investment in school library staffing and services is a central part of the actual practical answer to many of the pressing questions we're currently wrestling with with education today. For example, students needing to be savvy seekers, users, and creators of information. Um, moving how to move away from standardized testing and by improving the differentiation and authenticity and robustness of assessment. The problem we're wrestling with about reducing teacher workload. We play a role in that. 
and also the issue of equipping the youth of today with the skills to think critically, creatively, collaboratively, and with compassion to best enable them to tackle the huge and complex problems facing our world. This, I say to you, that this campaign is a genuine way to make a difference with those things. It is ironic that at the start of the 20th century, children did not have access to libraries because they could not afford to pay for the service. Now, at the start of the 21st century, they are faced with constraints in library services because no one can afford or is willing to pay for them. That's my plan for the next 45 minutes. Okay, so the why needs to come before the how and the what. So this is an obvious reference to that Simon Sinek um, TED talk that's excellent, um, called Start With Why. So um, why do we need to improve school libraries? To improve our students' lives now and into the future to improve their opportunities um, as individuals and also as a group, um, and to support a demo healthy democracy to create a better world. How do we do that? What do we do? We do it by teaching these essential skills, such as those things. We do it by providing quality resources and services that save people time and energy and provide um, opportunities for deep learning. There is, of course, a mountain of Australian and international research to support the positive impact of qualified library staff on student learning outcomes. Um, and of particular note to me is that that impact is independent of the student's socioeconomic status. I'm not going into any of that research in this presentation. Um, I'm taking that as assumed knowledge with this group. Um, but of course, there's lots of links to research on our website. A brief non-academic history of Australian school libraries. And this book, um, Life After Family Work, is really quite an interesting um, book. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So going back in time, um, when the first Europeans came to Australia, um, school libraries and libraries in general were ad hoc. Um, they were just run by individuals, um, churches, and school teachers. Um, in the 1890s, we have our first recorded children's library in Australia. Um, 1940s, um, the education departments first started providing funds for, to schools to purchase books. Um, Mid-1950s, school libraries begin to feature in education. The first teacher librarian course came in the 50s. Um, the 60s and 70s, from what I understand, were the heyday for public and school libraries. And then in the 90s, um, we have the roots of the current situation. And that's when things like compulsory competitive tendering, otherwise known as school autonomy, otherwise known as independent public schools, whatever label we're gonna put on it, um, that started coming in vogue. And that's when the <coughs> idea started coming up that was mentioned yesterday about qualified school library staff being on the negotiable list. So of course our goal is to get it back on the non-negotiable list. <coughs> um, so the Fenwick Report is a, is a report that uh, was published in 1966. Um, this woman, Sarah Fenwick, was a Fulbright lecturer from the University of Chicago, and she was invited to Australia by the Library Association of Australia, which is now ALIA. Um, and she spent six months studying all library services for children, um, including public library services, school libraries, and library and training. So her report was published the same year as the new standards for school libraries, which is interesting for those of us who were here yesterday um, hearing Marshall's speech about the importance of standards. Um, with both of them being published at the same time, it had a huge impact on public and political interest and knowledge about school libraries. And the first federal grants for secondary school libraries came in after that. Um, first quote, this is from 1966. A great obstacle to the progress of school library development is the lack of well-trained personnel in each individual school library. 
and then this analysis of the report um, by Valerie Johnson, Fenwick's findings that many excellent services and collections existed and were well maintained by professional staff was countered by the lack of access for so many children. So it's interesting and also sobering to see how familiar these concepts sound to our modern ears. A little bit of data coming up. So this is um, an analysis of the 2017 SoftLink staffing data um, combined with the Learning for the Future's um, recommended staffing levels for school libraries. Um, and that includes all library staff. So that's teacher librarians plus support staff. Um, now this is not published yet. Um, and it may still need some more refining, so I'm sharing it with you as an imperfect graph, um, and would, yeah, but I'm just sharing it for your information that as something in, in process. So what we're looking at here is the um, line coming out from the zero is the recommended staffing level, and the difference from the recommended living staff, uh, recommending staffing level is on the y-axis there. And then the x-axis is the socioeconomic status, um, the, which is defined by that Ixia score off my school website. So you can see that 89% of school libraries in Australia in 2017 were either somewhat or extremely understaffed, according to that table. Um, there are a few weaknesses with this data set. However, school library staffing data is virtually non-existent. It's very thin on the ground at the moment, and so we need to take what we've got um, and work with that at the moment. Although, I will mention that investigations and investment is currently being made as we speak um, that we hope will deliver a very high quality data set and give us um, an, an analysis of school library staffing. You might have noticed, as I did, that this graph looks extraordinarily like an iceberg. Um, and that, of course, is an apt metaphor for the consequences of weak school libraries upon the future of our young people. Also, no wonder, looking at this, that so many school library staff feel like a teacher librarian in regional New South Wales said to me recently that they are bouncing off the bottom of the pool. No wonder we're struggling to advocate for ourselves and for school library services for our students for completely overloading. However, make no mistake, I am asking you today to still, despite this situation, find the time and energy to, um, to fight for this campaign. And, it, and really it's because the situation is so dire that we have to. Um, the next two graphs are by a study um, published online by Acer, uh, by Paul Weldon over there, and I just pulled this one out. So this is um, primary school teachers in school libraries, the differences between 2010 and 2013, um, and looking at it according to socioeconomic status. That speaks for itself. And it's the same um, graph, but for secondary. This one is from um, the paper that Olivia Nielsen and I wrote last year called School Libraries Matter. It's available as a PDF on the ASLA website and also on our Students Need School Libraries website. Um, these are, this is information from the school library staffing surveys that we did in Canberra. So that one, um, on the far left is just looking at primary schools, and the red represents the average number, uh, or the mean full-time equivalent of support staff in the library. The blue represents the teacher librarian staffing. The little star represents the median of teacher librarian full-time equivalents. And then we've separated by independent Catholic and government sectors. 
This little table here is um, just a different kind of look at that data. Um, and so you can see the percentages of, of schools with a TL according to the different sectors. But then interesting to me is also the highest and lowest level of the teacher librarian separately and also combined with all library staff. So that's the teacher librarian plus the support staff. And you can see that even within each of these sectors, you have a really wide range. So um, there's not kind of a simple analysis of like the problem. It's, um, it's complex from a number of, um, a number of, of angles even though we can see that the trend is certainly that independent schools have far more than government and Catholic. So it's grim. The, the mood in the room right now is not good. Um, and there's no point denying it. Um, we are at a low point right now for school libraries in Australia. And for some good news. Um, so quick backstory on the campaign. These um, associations from around Australia came together in 2015, sending different representatives to form a coalition. And they're sponsoring the campaign and contributing funds to the website and other um, elements of the campaign. So we have a, a national body, so to speak, a, a working group. Um, the campaign itself launched in 2018, um, but for me, in my version of the story, the turning point came in 2016 when I was on a plane to Adelaide and um, to a meeting of these coalition representatives, a face-to-face -face meeting that we have once a year. And she said, oh, what are you doing in Adelaide? And I said, oh, I'm saving school libraries. And she kind of went, why? What's wrong with school libraries? And in the course of having this conversation with her, and she just madly started scribbling notes for thinking about her own children, I had a kind of penny drop moment. And I went, you know what? Most people have no idea about what is happening. They are assuming that all is well um, with their child's school libraries. Um, just a quick note about the name of the campaign. A lot of thinking and debate and um, focus group testing went into the naming of the campaign. I, that's a story for another day. Uh, but the bottom line is that the name is a, is a hook and it's kind of the tagline for what, what, we're, what our message is. But it definitely needs unpacking um, for people about what students really need being that they need the services that are provided by quality staff and qualified school library staff. <coughs> the campaign itself is run all by volunteers. Um, I'm the coordinator. We've got a leadership team of five, including Madison, who's standing back by the um, <coughs> camera right now, who I actually only ever met for the first time yesterday. Um, she's our committed and highly capable person who built the website. Um, so we've got five of us on the leadership team. We've got an email list of about 200 plus people who are saying, yep, I've got the time and energy to you know, be on call, to actively do things. Um, but we're all volunteers, we all have jobs, we all have families, we are living lives just exactly like you are, um, but we are carving out the time when we can to do what we can. Okay, tactics. So of course, lots of advocacy work has been happening for a very long time in Australia, um, but this campaign represents a change in tactics. So the previous tactics was that we've had sort of official leaders, you know, leaders of associations, um, and also scattered individuals who were kind of trying to do what they could. And most of those people were, as professionals, trying to target um, principals and politicians directly themselves. <coughs> Um, also, we were preaching to the converted amongst ourselves. So the new tactics are that we are targeting parents and the general public as our main target audience with this campaign in order that they can, we can support them to take the message to the, the principals and the politicians on our behalf. 
Um, we also have a distributed leadership um, and action um, that is scalable. So, um, meaning that we in our little campaign active group are trying to create things that people can just run with on their own, in their own local community. Um, our aims are obviously to change individual schools um, and also lots and lots and lots of individual minds. Um, and then with the idea that we will create a groundswell to change the conventional wisdom about school libraries so that then the politicians feel safe um, putting in a policy and committing funding to school library staff because they know that it's a, po a popular and accepted idea. So we've got sort of um, two phases to the campaign. We, the first phase is educate and celebrate. So sort of educating people what are school libraries actually all about. Uh, we've got 17 films that um, some students at my school in Canberra um, did incredible work on. And have of you seen any of the films? Okay, if you haven't, I highly recommend them. And I recommend you use them. Use them in staff meetings. Use them in presentations. Share them with others. You play one at your book club. Um, that's a little screenshot from one up there. Um, so we're breaking down when we're saying what are school libraries all about, we're saying that they're about these four things. Um, research with a particular focus on digital literacy. That's our hook. That's what gets people's attention because most people actually don't realize that, that we're involved in that. And they sit up and pay attention when we, when we lead with that as something that we do. Um, we're about resources and particularly coming at it from the angle of helping teachers. It's another thing that people don't really realize. Um, so everyone knows how important the individual teacher is, but most people don't realize how much we help them. And then of course, the flow and effect to the students from that. With regard to relationships, the particular angle is about well-being, um, which you know everyone in this room would have stories about how they've helped students that are having a hard time. It's a really important role and a unique role, I think you'd agree, um, within the school, within the adults in the school. Um, and, and then reading. So, um, you know, lots of the speakers yesterday talked about literacy. And I would invite you to talk with confidence about the evidence about reading for pleasure being the key to all academic success. Um, and our own expertise in that area, that it is far beyond what most classroom teachers have. So we have to play, our, play to our differences and our specialist skills. There's a very intentional order to these four things listed. So my intention for you in this training session, if we can call it that, is I'm saying to you, you, you talk about the research first. And if that's all you can talk about is digital literacy, in particular, if you have to pick one thing, talk about website evaluation. If you've got them for 15 seconds of their attention, say that alone, because that's the hook. Um, it's not necessarily a reflection of what the actual priorities are in a school library, but these are the priorities for the strategic conversations that we're gonna have about the campaign. Phase two is to add alarm. So we wanna alert them to the problem, we wanna provoke their alarm and interest, and we wanna always direct them to the website, direct them to the website, because that's where all the meat is and all the tools. Um, we're just kind of now starting to dip into adding a little bit of phase two alarm into our communications on our different <coughs> social media platforms. We're aiming to get to about sort of 80% educate and celebrate, 20% alarm at this stage. And we're looking for um, all of the ongoing process of providing practical support. So lots of practical tools, the films are one example. The recent flyer that we've created is another example of concrete things that people can, can use. That's our mission and our vision. So the first thing you can do is 
to try to connect with the mindset of the audience. And this is, this is actually, I, I reckon that this is a challenge because um, we are in that school library bubble. You know, we're so well informed about what it can be like. It's actually kind of hard for us to imagine or remember what it's like to be outside that. But most people out there still think that school libraries are only about those two things. Um, and they think that school librarians or teacher librarians just do that and that they are one of these adjectives, depending on whatever their personal experiences have been. Also, we need to remember that school library staffing levels are so bad and have been for so long that many teachers and even principals have actually never experienced what a school library can and should be like. They might think about what it was like when they were in school, um, which of course would not reflect all the behind the scenes work that is vital and so strong um, and so vital for a strong school library service. We did a little survey um, and we got some parents to answer it um, from all those states and territories in Australia and um, I noticed when I went through these that these are both number one so let's just say that they were both really important. Um, so digital skills, that's a top concern for them. You know, the thing about the fake news, the trust, choosing trustworthy information, the critical thinking, that's on their radar for sure, and we have to play to that. So that's why, again, if you try to say only one thing in connection to the campaign, say that, website evaluation, that's what we teach. Because that is a lifelong skill and vitally important that even adults are struggling with that right now. Um, also, they really resonate with, the, with feeling frustrated about themselves or maybe watching their child feel frustrated and making poor choices when that child is working on um, schoolwork at home. Um, so that, that resonates with parents and also again, the idea that when I talk to parents and I talk about how I help teachers, they go, oh, okay, because they really, you know, they care about their child's teacher. They want that person um, to be helped. So there's a few frequently asked questions coming up here. When people ask you these questions, this is how I would like you to answer it. So why are we campaigning? We're, we're doing this campaign because we're concerned about our students' lives. We're concerned about them now and we're concerned about them into the future. And then you follow that up with because school libraries provide improved opportunities they support a healthy democracy, they help create a better world. These are really lofty goals, but we're not lying, right? These things are true. Um, when they ask you, okay, well, what are school libraries about? Number one, they're about the staff. It's about who works there. Then you, then you can follow up with, you know, they're about these four things, the research, the resources, the relationships, the reading. And another one that they don't quite realize is that school libraries are about personalizing it. We, we really need to play that up, how we personalize the collection, we personalize the services according to what that particular school needs and to the individuals within it. Why is this happening, they might ask you. So when I say the internet, of course I don't mean the fact that the internet exists, that's not the problem. The problem is the misunderstandings that decision makers have about what's online. Um, and that they have, that has led them to think, some of them, to think that therefore school libraries are irrelevant, all they need is Google. We all would have heard these things before. But you know, if you kind of just, some people still believe that. And so, you know, if you just kind of say things like, look, if you just scratch a little bit beneath the surface, you'll see that that's really not true. The other issue um, is the invisibility and, you know, um, the fact that a lot of what we do is behind the scenes. My favorite thing to describe here is just when I'm helping someone one-on-one -on -one and talk about how, you know, okay, well, let's say a teacher comes to me and they, you know, want to revise an assignment that they've got. 
that they're planning for their kids to work on and I help them and we you know we make it better and we work on it together nobody sees that except for me and that teacher but what happens is that there's better learning outcomes for the students and they kind of go oh yeah it, like they just kind of of course why would they people think about what happens behind the scenes but then they you can see that understanding dawning on them um, and then of course the money and the school-based management um, it's useful I think to illustrate when you're talking about these things illustrate it with a little personal anecdote of which you have a multitude um, of that show um, that these things are happening. Now this this is really important, this one, um, because this is how we're going to set ourselves up for success. So let's just say we're making huge progress with the campaign and um, or like at a local school, you know, a principal goes, you know what, we're gonna do it, you're right, this is really important, we're gonna get some qualified school library staff in there, we're gonna get a teacher librarian. <laughs> These are the effective, the essential components of an effective school library policy. Number one, you have to have the right person, by which I mean you need to have a top operator. You need to have someone who's smart, who's organized, who gets along with people. It needs to be somebody like that who's proactive, of course, that person needs to have qualifications. However, that can come. The mo num number one is number one for a reason. So let's just say they, the principal might say, oh gosh, there's no qualified you know, teacher librarians around here. Then what we say is, okay, well then you pick somebody on your, ta on your staff, you shoulder tap someone, and you, I would encourage you all to do this too. When you come across someone and you, you might say, you know what, you'd make a really good teacher librarian someday. Just kind of plant that seed for them. And then they can start the training. Number three, you must have a team. And, um, if, you, if you put somebody in just to teach your librarian in there, there's no support staff, you're simply not going to achieve what we're describing here. You have to have the team. And number four, you have to have the time. Um, meaning some flexibility in the timetable and meaning some resource management time. So it's no use sticking, hiring a teacher librarian, that person is part-time, they've got no support staff, and they've got a rigid timetable providing release, and then, and then that everyone will look at them and say, well, hang on, you're not doing all these things that you know school libraries are supposed to do because you've tied the hair hands behind their back and set them up to fail. With these four things, that's when we, you know, we're living the dream and the student success goes through the roof. So I think it's important for us to be honest about our, you know, the weaknesses and the things that can bring this down. Number one, Achilles heel, in fighting. And there's a few different ways that infighting can manifest, but the, probably the most common one that sometimes rears its head is this whole thing about teacher librarians versus librarians. My message is that we are on the same team. There's been a strategic decision with the campaign because teach, to focus on the teacher librarian as the preferred specialist because of course they're qualified teachers and qualified librarians. Our campaign is targeting the general public, most of whom are unaware of the various different roles and titles within um, a, a library, and they would likely become confused and uninterested if we start to describe all the different complicated sort of differentiated roles. We need to keep it simple. Now, I fully acknowledge that there are nuances within this that are missed with that simple message. So they include the fact that not all qualified teacher librarians are good at their jobs. They um, include the fact that some many school libraries are being run right now by qualified librarians who are doing an excellent job. And they include the fact that oh, there's such a wide range of schools and locations across Australia that the reality is even if we get our, all of our policy achievements 
probably not all schools are going to be able to have their own teacher librarian and their own library support staff on the site. Now I know that this is a sensitive issue for many people in the field, but what we're encouraging is that people focus on the most important <laughs> concerns that we have in common, which is the improved education of young people in Australia and fair access, equitable access, to high quality school library services for all students. We just, we focus on what we can agree on, which is easy, easily that. The second Achilles heel is people who have had bad experiences with teacher librarians in the past. So we have to own that, that happened and is still happening sometimes. The positive of the current situation where numbers are so low is that we now have the opportunity to have a whole new generation of highly capable, newly trained teacher librarians joining the ranks. And that's basically how we have to spin it. The third Achilles heel is a lack of time to actively support the campaign. So, and I've already talked about that, uh, we know that students need what we're offering and we just simply have to dig deep and find the time. And another way to think about it, as was mentioned at the recent ASLA conference, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So, to do, this is your to-do list. Put the monkey on your back. I have a little friendly monkey that walks around me all the time. He looks a little bit like that. And his name is Campaign. <laughs> um, what I mean is just kind of have it in your mind. Have it in your mind. And bring it up whenever you can. Uh, number one, connect with the campaign. Really happy for you to pull out your device and do that now if you haven't. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and we have a newsletter that comes out twice a term um, that you would just go to our website and sign up for that. Be present in the opinion pages. This is with regard to newspapers and other mainstream or other media sources. So responsive, if something comes up about, you know, oh gosh, literacy rates are down, write a letter in. God, you know, school libraries will help with that. Qualified teacher librarians are really important. Um, same thing with anything about digital literacy. Oh, fake news! Guess what? School libraries can help with that. Take time and write a little letter. Reactive means that somebody else does that first one. Oh, school libraries would help with that. And then you write back to that. Oh, I saw what so-and-so wrote about school libraries. I also agree. And proactive just means you just do one off your own bat. This is what I do in my school library. Is your child's school library everything they can and should be? Just a little, little article. Um, and I can tell you from personal experience that writing into the paper is not that hard, um, and you actually get a really nice adrenaline rush out of it. Um, do a presentation. That's particularly for these people who, you know, you all who are in the room, you are, you are in the bubble, you are the knowledgeable professionals. Do a presentation to your own school, Get someone to invite you to a school that doesn't have qualified library staff. Find some way that the, a parent on the PNC will invite you to come. And you talk, come and you talk about, this is what school libraries are about. This is why they're important right now. Oh, and I might just add, um, my colleague Olivia and I did a presentation to the PNC um, large body down in Canberra like three years ago, and they are still actively advocating for us. Just from going in there and spending, you know, half hour, 45 minutes. They're 100% behind us still. It's fantastic. <coughs> More things. Um, if you would like to join that email list, if you feel like, yep, yeah, you know what, I'm, I'm likely to have time and energy, you know, to give to, to really doing something. You know, sometimes we need someone to do a specific task, and we put a little call out on that email list, <laughs> and people write in and they say, yep, yeah, I can do that. There's small, medium, and large tasks that need to be done. 
So if you go to that contact us um, on the website and just flick us a quick email that says, please add me to the email list. This flyer, hand up if you've seen the flyer buzzing around, fantastic. We put a lot of work into that and we're really proud of it. This is our current push, um, seven signs your child needs help from their school library. We, this is available on the website for download. We're encouraging people to go to businesses and other organizations and just ask them to support the campaign by printing off some of these and having them by the cash register. Um, or, you know, go to your local gym and say, hey, you know, do you mind if we stick one of these up on the notice board or the local shops or whatever? Just getting the word out to the general public and this is an, an eye-catchy kind of a thing. If you're nervous or unsure about how to have that conversation, Guess what? We've put a little helpful tips um, on that page on the website right near where you download the flyer that just really breaks it down in a nice, simple way with some suggestions about how to do it. We're, we're really trying to build in that scaffolding to get people to feel comfortable to do these things. Strongly encourage you to work with your union and your professional associations. That article there, We Are the Weather Makers, that's another one that Olivia and I wrote, also available on the ASLA website and on our website, that um, is about that process of how we've been working with the Australian Education Union down in Canberra. Really important. That's another angle, another prong to the success of this, is that industrial relations angle. You know, there are things that can be built into the enterprise agreement about resource management time, for example. Um, and staffing and requirements for qualifications. That bottom one, do your job well, that helps the campaign. Especially when you ask them to share um, and connect them to the campaign when they're feeling really grateful. So, I mean, we do that in our school anyway, when, um, you know, when a teacher says, gosh, that was really great, Holly, thanks so much. Um, you know, this assignment is much better now, and I, and I just say, well, look, hey, do you mind standing up at a staff meeting and just telling everybody, the other teachers, that you got something out of this experience? And that's how that ripple effect happens. You know, they're not gonna believe me so much if I say, hey, I can be useful. But if someone else says, she was useful, right? So it's the same thing with the general public or with students or, you know, especially with other people that you might help. You might say, you know what, I'm, I'm really happy to help you. Um, how about you connect with our campaign because this is really important and it's not everybody realizes how good it can be. This is just a screenshot from Flickr with um, the search term conversations um, because this to me is the real, real backbone of what we need to do. Yes, the social media platforms are important but like I said with my example about giving that little presentation you know, years ago, still reaping rewards, it's the one-on-one -on -one or small group conversations that are gonna have the most lasting impact face-to-face. -face. This is a little list of um, help to help you think broadly about your sphere of influence. Have you talked with all these people about your work or about school libraries in general? Your extended family? Great dinner table conversation. My family will love it. <laughs> um, your children's school, you know, when you're waiting to pick your kids up. Your partner, your neighbors, local businesses, clubs, sporting clubs maybe, kids or adult sports, your union, social media, faith organizations. Really, there's, there's such a broad range of influence with school library services. You can work it into almost any conversation. And I say that from personal experience. <laughs> this is just me being good <coughs> in my little, all my images. We um, got on the cover of the big issue. Um, the cover story was such, so exciting. Um, and they're gonna give us that as a PDF to put on our website too, it was a really good article. Over to you.
Thank you, Molly. That's uh, going to inspire. So what I'm actually